Welcome to Learning Through Technology, a K-12 EdTech podcast brought to you by STS Education. We strive to be the bridge that connects communities of educators so that they can fulfill the promise of learning through technology. Join us every other week as we connect with education leaders who share their deep experience with the education and technology topics you are grappling with in your own schools and districts. Each interview is designed to bring you tangible ideas you can start using tomorrow. I'm Alex Inman, the founder of Educational Collaborators. And I'm Bob Sabruti, founder of the Edutech Group. Welcome to the show. Hi, Bob. We have got a great guest today. So Bill Bass, an expert in the use of virtual reality in education. Should be a good show. I don't know what your experience is with VR in education. What are your thoughts about this? I don't know. I'll just tell you how it is. So the EdgeTech Group has started working with two schools recently that are already using VR. They've got headsets that they've bought off the shelf somewhere that they're trying to make work in their school. And it's led to a lot of frustration, honestly. There's you know, oh. no <laughs> curriculum. There's no, uh, yeah, yeah, right. No <laughs> frustration in school with technology. There's no curriculum and there's no cohesiveness to what they're trying to accomplish. And they're thwarted. So once in a while, you get this glimpse. It all comes together, a great environment, and you see it come together, and it's just phenomenal. The kids, it's like, oh, my God, this is going to change the world in the way education works. So that's what we need to know is we got to figure out how to get there all the time. Well, I think you're in for a treat, actually, because Bill has been training schools and districts across the country on VR and education for probably close to five years. So let's see what he has to say. Can't wait. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today's guest, Bill Bass, has been working in education for 25 years. And throughout that time, one of his main focuses has been on the innovation and implementation of new technologies into the school system. From pioneering paperless classrooms in the early 2000s to becoming the innovation coordinator for Parkway School District outside of St. Louis, Missouri, 10 years and counting. If it could exist in the classroom, Bill Bass makes sure it can. As technology advances quicker than ever before, Bill joins us today to talk about how education can be taken outside the classroom from within the classroom. Bill Bass, welcome to the show. Hey, well, thank you, Alex and Bob. I appreciate it, and I'm happy to be here. It's great to have you. So you and I have known each other for years, actually, when I was a tech director in the St. Louis area. So we got to know each other then. We've done some work together with educational collaborators, and I am just sort of a constant student of you learning from all of the innovative things that you've done. So you would had another whole career sort of before you and I had a chance to meet. So kind of going back to your days of like a soccer coach in Winfield to eventually becoming the president of the board at the International Society for Technology in Education, which everybody just calls ISTE, being the board president of ISTE. Walk us through your career and how do you get from being one to the other? Yeah, so it actually is really interesting. I think about when I started. So back in the late 1900s, that was when I entered the classroom. Um, and, you know, if we, if we think about it. Wait, so you and Alex were there together. Feels like right? you took like right. a covered wagon to that space there. <laughs> a little bit. We uphill both ways in the snow, walking with bare feet, right? It was a different time. So when I was in college, I got an English degree just because I like to write. And I like to tell stories and things like that. And then I realized that there's not a lot of career paths and opportunities that would be stable for just someone with an English degree. Um, sure, I could say things and write things and read really well, but that didn't actually translate into a career. And so I decided, okay, I'll teach because I like teaching. I had done summer camps. I was a coach for kids for soccer and gymnastics and all kinds of stuff along the way. So I became an English teacher and I figured that I was going to do this for a little while. And my goal was really just, I want to teach kids to write. That was my thing was writing. And I wanted to teach kids to write. And I owe it to my high school English teacher. Like he was the guy who taught me more about reading or writing specifically than anyone else that I had ever had any other teacher along the way. And I just like, I saw myself doing that. So Rocky Graziano, if you are out there and listening to this right now, you are the reason. And I've told you this before, but you're the reason that I started doing the things that I do. I got to know a little bit about Rocky. So like, where were you studying at this time? Where'd you go to high school? I was in Des Moines, Iowa, Southeast Polk High School. It was kind of a rural area just outside of Des Moines, home of Adventureland, the Sula theme park. And it's in the middle of Iowa. I lived right beside it. 
But Rocky was my English teacher by senior year. He taught me how to write. When I went to school, I was excited about writing. And truly, I owe it to him. I would not have been a writer. I have three books now that I published. I would not have done any of that without this guy. And so that was inspiring. I went through, I started teaching in middle school, moved up to high school and then changed districts and kind of coached soccer all the way through. But then I knew I needed my master's because that's what teachers do. And so I began thinking about, you know, like, what do I want to do? And so my boss at the time, my department chair, name was Rhea Cox. And she put me in a classroom because there was this opening for this media position. It's called modern media. It wasn't so modern, incidentally. It was like we studied newspapers and radio and things like that. So to call it modern was a stretch. Early 1900s, even. <laughs> Early 1900s media. Yes. That's Alex's what we were time. studying. We, we call that Alex's time in the 1900s. <laughs> All right. Good. Okay. So during Alex's time, I spent my time. Like they put me in a computer and legitimately, this was 1998. So it really was the late 1900s. But in 1998, they put me in a room with computers and they were like, good luck. And I was like, "Uh uh-oh. And so I knew I had to get my master's. I went and got a master's in instructional technology. And so, and really it was around the design for instructional technology. And I got hooked immediately and I was excited about it. I mean, I took two computer classes in college. I didn't care. I just wanted to write things. And so the fact that from there till now, drastically different. But that path kind of, I was put in a classroom out of necessity because they needed somebody to do it. And I figured out how to do it. And I figured out how to engage kids with computers. Fast forward, I got my master's. I got a degree in online learning and I created a paperless classroom in my class. And this was like before Google Docs. We didn't have that collaborative space. I taught my kids how to do grammar through HTML because it's all patterns. And so I taught my kids in English class how to write HTML so that they would recognize patterns in their language and then translate that into punctuation. And so that was our start of kind of really thinking differently about what we do in the classroom. Okay, I get punctuation and syntax with HTML. Okay. I'm all with you on that. Grammar in HTML? Grammar in HTML. Because if you think about grammar differently, if you don't think about it in terms of this is the subject and this is the verb, and you think about it in terms of structure. Yes, we talked about language, subject, verb, and things like that, but we didn't necessarily focus on through the HTML. I got kids that I would never have gotten talking about past participles. They didn't care. But with HTML, when they could type something and see it on their screen and be like, home, okay. So it was structure. And that was the entry point in the talking about grammar. It was structure and creation, right? Because like... It was. Writing is still obviously making something, right? But to see sort of like a digital product as a result of your writing, I get it. There's power there. And to see it immediate and to see your product, you know, like you said, save and here it is and you upload it to... I mean, legitimately, like we uploaded it via SMTP and like we had FTP servers. It was a mess, but we managed and my kids created digital portfolios in 2001. And so it was a different time, but like I got hooked, my kids got hooked. It snowballed from there. From there, you know, I began getting more involved in like national things and eventually got involved with ISTE. I remember the first time I saw the ISTE standards, I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that these things were real. And this was around 2007. And so right after they got published, you know, like the main ones got published. And so I was always seen in my department and all that as like the computer guy or somebody that was like paying attention to that digital space and pushing people and That kind of, you know, I became a department chair and then I became a tech coach and instructional coach. And now I'm a district administrator responsible for innovation. And during that time, just was fortunate enough to be elected to the ISTE board and then became president of the ISTE board. I had no idea that that would even be like my path. Are you kidding? I had no idea. But it really did all of those things like shifted and shaped who I would become as the leader, as a technologist, as an educator, and truly like as a father and as a husband and thinking broadly about the impact that I have or that I hope to have on 
educators across the country. That's really what I have been thinking about for at least almost 17 years now. Just how can I have a bigger influence and impact? Great that you want to have a big impact. I'm a little hung on how do you use HTML to parent your children? So maybe <laughs> not HTML. I did teach them how to code though. Like that was early on when there were munchkins, like real quick, let me just tell you a story. I would bring home all manner of stuff, right? Like coding things. I brought home a 3D printer when my daughter went and got into 3D printing in her industrial tech class in middle school. She was like, seriously, I already know how to change filament. I don't need to listen to my teacher tell me about all the safety features of the 3D printer. And she was over it. She had zero interest in participating, but I made her. It has shaped them too, though. Like they do all right. <laughs> so we get this cheat sheet, I'll call it, from our producers that has some of your background information and what you've done in your career. And all I hear while Alex is talking is blah, 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 because I see virtual reality and augmented reality. And I want to talk about that because... <laughs> I was a kid in the 80s who played video games, spent plenty of time on my Atari 2600. If you've heard our other podcast, you'll hear about me gaming. And I read books and I watched movies with virtual reality in it. And that was stuff that was never going to happen in my lifetime. And now it's here. So we've got the guy in charge of the future here with us today. So let's talk about virtual reality. Tell us a little bit about- No pressure. No pressure, Bill. No pressure. Right, right. A little bit about VR. You know, from the 1900s, I've drugged VR with me to 2023. So tell us a bit about VR now in general, and then about it in the classroom. There's a lot of debate right now around where does VR live in our classes? And a lot of times, you know, a few years ago when we had Google expeditions like that, put VR on the map and then they killed it. But you know, I mean, whatever. <laughs> no way. Google killed something we were using. Right. Who knew? Like it was such a transformational experience for teachers as well as for students, because suddenly they could kind of as you say, Bob, see the future. They did not have any conception of what that was going to look like. And so really, when we think about VR now, we think about the role that virtual reality plays in our schools. Like we can give kids opportunities and experiences that they could never have. And for a variety of reasons. And that's one of the things that I continue to go back to every time I talk to teachers is I talk to them about Jeremy Galenson did some work and he's with the Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab. So at Stanford, he did this work and he created this acronym called DICE. And so DICE, it's well established in VR and education, but DICE, it's an acronym that stands for dangerous, impossible, counterproductive, and expensive or rare. So those four things are the reasons that VR can kind of exist in educational spaces. Because if it's too dangerous, you're not going to do it. You're not going to do something that's going to put kids in danger, but you can do it inside a virtual reality headset. You can do it in a simulation. You can do it by taking kids places. Like those are different. If it's impossible, you can't take kids in a bloodstream, right? <laughs> we can't do that. And we can't take them on a tour of the heart really immersively with the plastic model that we used to show that we need to you know, like open up and we would see the four chambers of the heart. Like that is cool and all, but it doesn't actually engage them in the same way. If it's counterproductive, there's a story that he tells about how, you know, in the seventies, if a dad caught a kid smoking, he would, you know, like make him smoke a pack and that would teach him, well, there's some damage that's done there. Right. And so not really a good idea. We might get in trouble in 2023 if we were to do that. If I saw a kid with bad grammar, I would teach him HTML until they got that grammar right. He's going <laughs> to understand much better. That's right. But that counterproductive nature is really important. It's a thing. And then, you know, finally, expensive or rare. We can't take kids to the bottom of the ocean. We can't take them across the sea in bulk. We have trips and all that. But all of those things are the reasons that VR can kind of work inside of our schools. And it really do does provide us as educators the opportunity to create learning experiences that are different and that are going to engage kids in really meaningful ways. And because if we're not engaging them in meaningful ways, they don't actually care. And it's a huge component of bringing to life education. We always want to do that. We talk about it all the time. We talk about it when we were in education classes in college. They talked to us about you have to bring education to life. And that was at the end of the conversation. Now we actually have the tools to bring those things to life for kids. 
in dramatically different ways than we once could. So let's a little bit on the logistics of that, because like I'm envisioning and I'm understanding what you're saying at sort of an individual level. So first of all, when we're talking about VR, are we talking about like the headsets, the goggles? Because I think that's a more immersive experience than perhaps at the screen, but still even at the individual screen, you can get some of that experience with through like a Z space and those kinds of tools. But you don't have one kid in your class. You're not just creating an experience for one kid. So what do the logistics look like when you've got 27 kids in your classroom and you want your students to have that immersive experience? How do you do that? I think a few things you have to consider. As somebody who purchases things in my district, and as somebody who vets and, you know, evaluates and all that, there has to be a few things that you have to kind of understand how to manage. First of all, you have to manage the devices. They're all connected to the network in some form or fashion. So you have to be able to manage those, push out updates, be able to get kids to the right place, because that's the problem. As a teacher, you have 27 kids in headsets. You have no idea where any of them are. They could be in the store, they could be on the web, like you don't know. And so there's a challenge there and that makes teachers really uncomfortable, right? So we have to be able to manage that. So classroom management becomes a big piece. So we have to manage the headsets technically. We have to manage the headsets from a classroom, from a teaching perspective. And then we have to be able to manage the content that gets on those headsets. So whether that's content that you purchase from a provider, from a textbook company, or you know, there's hundreds of providers out there, or if it is going to like a YouTube 360 and being able to give kids access just through a link, like those are logistical things that teachers need to be comfortable with and understand. So you need a solution that's going to help with that. So Alex, we've worked with Lenovo for a number of years now on that. They have a great solution right now. Now, obviously, they're not the only game in town, but they do have a great solution that really provides that level of management overall. So what does that solution sort of look like? So you terrified me as an educator. You just told me that everybody's going to be in every different spot. They're going to have these headsets on different applications. I got to figure out how to update these things. I got to figure out how to manage these things. What does that look like? How do you sort of overcome those logistical and classroom management challenges? Well, I think that first of all, you have to have a tool. And so like, for example, with Lenovo, they have the immersive learning hub and everything happens in there. You create a playlist. And then you can push those playlists out to the headsets that you have in your classroom. And then in those headsets, you start the experience for kids and they can't do anything other than that experience. So you really are managing that. So that's one mode of the headsets. You can also have what we call free play mode. And in that free play mode, what happens there is that they have the opportunity to kind of explore because as educators, we know education is about exploration. And so we want to have both of those, you know, you can have exploration, which is what's happening in a teacher tools component of that. And then you have free exploration where kids can go and they can learn about the things that like they are deeply interested in that can really engage them in different ways. But that management of that is critical. I've seen it lots of different ways. We've used lots of different products in my right. district and when you don't have that oversight per se, even if it's not, you know, I'm not trying to catch kids doing the wrong thing. In fact, I want them to do the wrong thing, right? Because I want to help them. But I want to be sure that as a teacher, I'm not going to use it if I can't manage it, if I can't make sure that I'm meeting my goals because we don't do VR for the sake of VR. Even though it's cool, even though we dig the headset, we do it with a purpose. And every time we engage with VR, we have to have that purpose in mind. Because if we don't, it's playtime. And that's a really critical piece that I think that we have to continue to address over time. And the other misnomer, let me also say this, the other misnomer that I find all the time is that we think that every kid has to be doing, having the exact same experience at the exact same time. And here's the thing, in VR, no one has the same experience ever because you can see whatever you want. It's not linear. And I talk about that with teachers when they're creating VR or they're creating experiences. They are no longer in charge of the student experience. And it's really empowering for kids because students are become in charge of that experience. They have choice. Now, it may be a, a series of choices of our choices as educators, as designers, but we don't direct their attention nearly like we do inside of more traditional linear learning opportunities. And so that's a mindset shift that we really have to think about differently. 
I think for me, that goes back to storytelling and how we engage kids in their path. Because if I, I mean, honestly, like if I thought of a linear path when I was in high school, this would not be where I am right now. I would not be in this seat talking to you guys. Imagine a future where students can access tools that spark learning, growth, and creativity. At Lenovo, our K-12 solutions are designed to create a world where EdTech tools are safe and secure, engaging and easy to use, and built for productivity wherever learning takes place. We partner with customers and value lasting relationships. We work closely with you to assess your needs, evaluate options, and customize solutions. We understand the dynamics and trends shaping K-12 today and tomorrow and how they affect your specific situation. We can help you plan wisely to deploy and scale solutions that will deliver the best student and teacher experiences and improve learning outcomes. We do this all while implementing the right education technology for your use case and budget. Visit us at the link in the show notes below. So you've told us a bit about what we're doing now and what can happen. And I work with a lot of schools and I will say that only a handful are using VR tape any at all in the few that are tip of the iceberg, right? They're dabbling. I think it's important for teachers and administrators and parents to know why do they have to learn it? What's going to happen in the future with VR and AR, if you'd like, that makes it important that we know now, like, when I was in school, I learned to type dumb luck that I took a typing class, but it's paid off big, right? It was, we'll just say it's helped me to be eligible to play baseball, but it paid off. This is something that's going to pay off if the students have it now. So what's the future going to be? I think a couple things. First of all, we're going to see a lot more simulation type things in terms of training and in terms of even the work that we do. Like we have even, like, if you think about medical field, if you think about the ways that we do even surgery right now, right? A lot of the surgery isn't by somebody who is sitting in the room anymore. It's done through a robot. And a lot of times that's done through a virtual reality experience of some sort because they are engaging in that. They can see it, but they have to manipulate the robot through virtual reality. Like that is the concrete, really good reason. And now granted, that's just the medical field, but we're going to see more and more of that with simulations and ultimately, when I think about education, the reason that we create experiences for them is to give them a broad breadth of understandings and experiences that they can take with them in order to make decisions when they're in their futures. And so with virtual reality, when we think about like the future of virtual reality, first of all, we're going to see more of it. Augmented reality is going to kind of bleed into this as well. And I think there's great advancements that continue to happen in augmented reality. But with virtual reality specifically, I think it's going to give us, and it's already started to, but it's going to give us more opportunities to experience things that we could never experience because of really going back to that whole dice thing. It's too dangerous as people who walk around in the world. We need to understand like the implications of these experiences that we're trying to create. And so I think we're going to continue to see more of it. I think it's going to become more and more critical in education specifically so that Bob, to your question, when the students leave us, they have not just read about something, but they've experienced something. And that is going to guide them in their future endeavors because that experience is going to provide them with context in order to make decisions in their future. And that's why we teach kids. That's why we have schools. That's why we spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about how to really engage kids and how to bring technology to them so that they are able to navigate the digital world that we live in and be successful in that, in whatever endeavor they have. And truly, virtual reality is just one component of that. But it's a really important one because it provides experience and it provides that immersion that we can't necessarily do in classrooms and that we can't necessarily do in our real lives as well. Am I the only one who, when he talked about going through the heart in VR, thought that's cool and also from Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> totally. All going in. There right? is right? absolutely no. a flashback, 100%. <laughs> See, I got it. So a bit more on the serious side, I was definitely a learn by doing, not a learn by reading. I would have memorized a heart if I could pass through it, but I could look at the pictures in a book and listen to lectures all day. And well, the proof is not learn a thing. 
and there was no VR. So I certainly do see that. So as you were talking, it occurred to me that like, this isn't more expensive, it's less expensive. When I was taking chemistry classes in college, we all had to buy these expensive modeling kits for modeling in organic chemistry, modeling. And now I see that they're doing this for, you know, you buy one license and every kid can model and build their own organic chemistry. You can synthesize methanol. It's just amazing. Like, I don't want people to think about the expense because in reality, it gets cheaper when you do it right. And you replace those old technologies from Alex's time in the early 1900s. <laughs> do you find that though, Bill? Do you feel as a purchaser at your district that something like this actually can decrease your cost per experience for the kid? Or is the cost just insurmountable? No, it's definitely not insurmountable because I think there's lots of ways to fund it, first of all. Like there is money. If it is a priority for you and you want to do it, like schools can find money. However, you know, like if you figure out how to offset some of that because of the experiences that you're providing and the modules that you're purchasing, you can kind of offset, Bob, to your point, some of the chemicals or some of the modeling or some of the equipment that you need. I think where we fall down is as educators and as adults, we often think, oh, you know what? This is the way I did it. So this is the way that I understand it. And so this is the way that it makes sense for me. And I think that's where we kind of have, I don't want to say issues, but that's our mindset. And so we really do have to think about it in terms of, you know, if we are going to purchase this thing to do organic chemistry and we have the ability to use virtual reality to do that, it can definitely offset, but it's not going to offset immediately. You have to have that initial investment and then you have to have buy-in because if you don't have buy-in and if you don't have the teachers understanding the importance and the fact that it does offset, then it, it can get relatively expensive. It's a license and you can use that with multiple kids. And that's really is the key. You get a license for a headset, off you go. But it doesn't necessarily translate directly. And usually in my experience, you don't see that offset for about three years. So you do have to figure out in that three year period of time, what are you willing to give up? Because as soon as every time you get something new, you're giving up something else in schools, there's typically no new money, right? So how do we manage that along the way? So I was thinking about this, and this goes to show how slow I am. No jokes from you, Alex, about being the smart one of the two of us. <laughs> I literally came to this podcast from a career center that we work with, where they do great work in more vocational education. But duh, they do virtual welding on everything because it's cheaper to do VR welding. And I weld. I do some welding myself, so I've used the virtual. And we have uh, where I'm at here in Northeast Ohio, Lincoln Electric is world headquarters. It's just on the street from us. But even then, with their donations and their support, we still do a lot of VR welding. And the school makes the investment in that because it's cheaper than real welding and gives you the same. But then you can use that high performance equipment, goggles for other things. So maybe the answer is we got to find that in in your school? Where is it where this makes financial sense and then spread it amongst the other programs or the other grades or the other schools? Bob, I think that's a really good point because you don't always have to create an initiative around something. You don't always have to have a, a big project to do because sometimes it's just kind of getting that foot in the door. And I do think, and I say this to folks all the time, like peer pressure can be a really positive thing. Like we talk about it in terms, it's always a negative thing. It's not always a negative thing because what happens is kids start talking to each other. And then they start talking about, oh, I just did this really cool thing. And so there's a competitive nature and there's pressure for teachers to learn beyond. And that kind of peer pressure, like I'm in on because it really is for the best interests of kids. And so we don't have to create an initiative. You have to create an opening. And so the difference between an opening and an initiative, funding wise, it can be massive. But impact wise, it can be even more massive and more of a sort of a incremental kind of change management sort of approach to the growth of the solution, which also kind of lowers those front end costs associated with that three year adoption. Right. Like you can start to get some speed on that adoption before you drop the money. That's good. You said something earlier that's kind of been rattling around in my head and I want to get it out before we move on. And that is that immersive experience and the personalization and the understanding that comes from it. Is there any research on students developing increased empathy as a result of experiencing something via immersive learning like VR versus a book or a lecture? 
Yeah. So I know that there is. I can't point to it right now, though. So sorry about that. But I do know that it exists. So briefly, just really fast, just let me tell you a little story. There was a VR simulation. I think it was called The Tree. And the way that it worked, it was that you get involved in this and you start out as a seedling. And you essentially grow, you see yourself grow, you see ants walking by and things like that. And it, it is linear, right? But you grow from a seedling into a small tree and to a big tree. It rains and it does all this stuff. And it's you grow and you hold your arms out to your side and you look over and like your arms are branches and then you have leaves and things like that. And then pretty soon you start to, you smell different things. So it's also, it's a really immersive experience. And so it's not typically done in like normal everyday K-12 classrooms. It's a little more than that. But pretty soon as the facilitator of the experience, they light a match. And in that match, you smell fire and you start to look around and you notice that there's a wildfire coming at you and you're a tree. You can't move. And the wildfire, you know, gets closer and closer and closer. And you feel like I did it. You get this anxiety inside and it's kind of an awful experience, but it's also a really interesting one as well to think about because you have become this tree and eventually like you're engulfed with this flame. And for some people, it completely freaks them out. And for other people, like I took it as an academic experience actually, because, you know, education, but like you return to the earth as part of the earth again. And so it's, that, it's meant to show that cyclical cycle. But the fact that you have this emotional reaction to it really shows me that it is not just academic. It's not just about getting content. It's about feeling the things. And when we take kids to different parts of the world, like third world countries and things like that, in order to find them empathy and in order to kind of get them to see what the world is like, outside of their little bubble, it has a profound impact on some kids. And they begin trying to do social work and, you know, like helping those things because it now means something to them. So when I think about that empathy piece, I know there's research out there that talks about it, but I think the story is much more powerful to understand, like you feel it. It's not just reading it in a book. It's not just listening to somebody talk about it. Like you actually are there and you feel the interaction between all of the components that can tell about. And that's where I think there's real power. Um, so let's actually chat a little bit. And thank you for that. So just one last question. I know VR is really much more popular and used and there are many more resources for VR in education today. We're starting to see more uses of augmented reality in web-based applications and phone applications and that kind of stuff. How is AR being used today in education and what do you kind of see the future of AR being? Yeah, so when I think about AR, what I really think about is that it is providing context to everything, to anything that you can point a camera at or a screen at, it's providing that context. And whether that is an overlay of just a label of information with some text in it, whether that's a video that's composed of that, or whether it's a link to something else that provides more information about that. Context is what matters when it comes to AR. And so that's where I think education is all about context. Education is all about providing and understanding the ways that things interact with each other. And so the combination of what I see is I see a kind of a combination of VR and AR together, like having that virtual experience and then being able to overlay some of those real world things that you were just learning about in VR into an AR context and, and really kind of bringing that out and helping kids make connections. That's where I see the power of it. And that's where I see it being used right now a lot is a lot of times people think AR, oh yeah, that's Pokemon Go, right? Like that's that game that I go and people are flicking their screen. I don't understand it. And while that's true, that's one application of it. But when we look at it in terms of education, being able to navigate the world and have that additional context coming at you, especially when you can choose what you need. You know, everybody has the same experience in a lot of classrooms. AR really gives you the ability to kind of, you can filter out different types of content. 
and different types of context. So it's the context that matters to you for the task that you're doing right now. And I think that's where inside of education, that's going to be critical for us to not just figure out, but that's where I see us moving towards is bringing personalized learning into AR applications so that it is what matters to you is not what matters to me necessarily, but we're both going to be able to have an experience that provides a similar context. Wow. In that space. Hyper-personalized sort of learning. Hyper-personalized. I mean, really. And I think what I see it going is we put in the context that we're looking for for the task that we're doing, or maybe it's vice versa. We put in the task and then we ask for the context with that. And then whatever that platform is, you know, like filters for us and provides us what it thinks we want. And then we're able to customize that going forward. And it's because our needs change based on every time we use it. So we may be looking for something completely different for another purpose. And that context needs to change with us as opposed to forcing us to change because of the context. Awesome. Bob, you want to bring us home? <laughs> Me? I never get to bring us home. Like, I never get to ask the first question or the last question. I'm here to make irreverent pop references to movies and video <laughs> games. <laughs> but I actually do have a question. So we have always tried to wrap up with a question that gives us a little idea of what you think and like and from your ed tech career. So if you could take anyone from education or ed tech to lunch, who would you like to have lunch with? I'm going to say that posthumously, I would take Sir Ken Robinson. I would love to have a conversation with him and just spend some time learning and understanding like how he thinks and how his journey along the way. I think that I've always been fascinated by him since the moment that I saw his TED talk and read his books and all that. Like he is the guy that I thought, I think has been visionary. He's impacted me, even though I met him once. I shook his hand and that was about the end of it. Hi, I'm Bill Bass. Good to see you. Man, he was doing his thing, but he had, he's such a profound impact on me. And the other person I would take out to lunch, and I referenced him earlier, is Rocky Graziano. And just talk to him about, you know, like how he shaped my world and theoretically, and hopefully I had been able to shape the world of kids and teachers and education along the way. I feel like I have to throw in something here because I, a less than stellar student and a math kind of guy, I was an engineering student. Two English teachers of mine were my favorite teachers. Uh, S.K. Parrish and John Wampum had a huge impact on me. And I'm shocked at that because I was not any, one of those students. But I feel like, yeah, that would be a great lot. We asked that question of everybody. And that's who I'd want to have lunch with. I completely agree with you, Bill. That would be a good lunch to go back and thank them for what they've done for us and how they've impacted us all along. Yeah, I think it's important. I think that gratitude is such a big piece of, at least, you know, for me, what I kind of think about when I think about my career and all the people who have impacted it over time. That's just a good question for our audience too, right? Like what teacher influenced you, you know, to make the career choices and life choices that you've made? I don't know a single person that you can ask that question to where they don't kind of get a smile on their face, right? <laughs> yeah. And just right. enjoy a little bit of joy. So Bill, I mentioned we're going to ask you for some resources at the end, if you can just sort of follow up to an email that we'll send you with anything that you think our listeners would be interested in. But just now off the top of your head, are there any sorts of resources that you think our listeners should go after and take a look at to kind of help them understand the power and benefits or practicality of using VR in the classroom? First of all, there's so much content out in the world right now. It's actually easy to find VR content. I say that knowing that it's still hard to find quality stuff sometimes, but it's out there. The first thing that I always go to, anybody who wants to talk about VR, I'm like, have you looked at YouTube 360? Period, done, like start there. That's where you should start. And then New York Times. New York Times has a whole virtual reality component that you can use in the classroom. You can use for your own purposes. Don't think that VR is just games and all that. There are so many resources out there. And I think those are the, those are two that I often go to. If you're looking for like a collaborative space, I think Mozilla has two great products and one is called Hubs. The other one is called Split. Both of those are huge in just in terms of that interaction, have being able to interact with other people inside in a social space inside of VR, I think is critical. 
when we think about, you know, uh, VR content, not beyond content, like philosophically, how do you utilize and, and things like that? ISTE has some great resources that go along with virtual reality that are like, here are some resources to bring in, but here's also why you might want to use it. Jamie Donnelly is an ISTE author and she has a whole host of strategies and a book or two around how VR exists in those spaces. And I think those are some really strong resources that I would point people to. And then finally, I would say if you're wondering about VR as a whole and why to use it in education or looking for some things that are going to prompt you as a teacher, look up the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at from Stanford. Jeremy Balin said that was, that's where that DICE acronym came from. He has great stuff and they have been working on VR. For them, VR is not new at all. Like they've been doing this for a long time and it's really great stuff to kind of help you frame a VR in your head because it is about that mindset shift sometimes. So I told Alex before we started this, when we saw you on our list of people to interview, how excited I was because I couldn't wait to talk about VR and AR and it has lived up to it completely. Your enthusiasm for it is contagious. And I mean, I can't wait to see the resources and start doing my own homework on this. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be great. Bill, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. We really appreciate you having you. This was wonderful. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And I look forward to you talking to you all again someday. Bob, that was a lot of fun. I mean, I know Bill. I enjoy talking to him anytime, but that was a lot of fun. What did you think? If you think that was fun, wait until you hear what I have to say about it. Okay. I'm going to say this slow for you so you can enjoy it because I know you never hear it, but you were right, Alex. Bill knows his stuff. <laughs> Good. Get it out of your system. Oh, let me write this down. Hold You're on right. a moment in time. Right. There, there you go. Alex Edmund writing it down in a video podcast. Awesome. <laughs> I think it all back. It's also going on post-it notes, right, by the way. And, the, and um, <laughs> this will be the clip on the Education Collaborators social media feed now. Right, Bob, right, right. Right. <laughs> right. Bill's family will be looking for him and only see me saying, Alex, you were right. Was right. Over and over and over again. <laughs> all right. Time to move on, Alex. Okay. Uh, we could end this right now, but what was I right about? So obviously Bill knows his stuff, right? Yeah. I knew the potential. I talked about the problems of VR and AR, but I knew the potential. But then when he talks about empathy and, and being stuck as a tree, you can't move and the fire is coming at you. I know what I feel like watching a movie that has you tensed up or some anxiety, but to be a tree and it's moving at you, well, he said it exactly right. It was, it's awful, but good feeling to understand that, which at the time made me think about our podcast, right? It's awful. <laughs> awful, but good. <laughs> Less good when you're right though, Alex. So for the good of the podcast, I think it only makes it better. So what about you? What did you think? I really enjoyed that empathy piece, right? Because empathy really is just fundamentally deeper learning. And as educators, how could we not want a deeper sense of learning and understanding from our students, right? I mean, that's what we see. There are a lot of technologies that are whiz bang. And I think the earliest days of VR were not a whole lot more than just sort of whiz bang opportunities. But the curriculum, the opportunities, the development really is providing powerful ways for students to deepen their understanding of that which we are seeking to teach. I think that that's just really incredible. I went to lots of classes. You'll be shocked by this, but I went to lots of classes where I sat there, paid attention, and then forgot every bit of it when I walked out. I can't imagine I would ever forget the feeling of being that tree. Like I just heard about it and I won't forget about it. So something that came up in there, Bill's got this great long resume. But it occurred to me while we were talking is that he's a collaborator with the education collaborators, right? So as he's talking, I'm like, I need to get this guy with my school because they need to see this. This is where it's at. So that's my next step. <laughs> well, we were happy to sign him up to come to your schools and show them how. And, and it's, it was fun to that point, actually, it really was fun for me to be sort of on the audience side of him sharing all that stuff. We work with him and his team in the creation of that VR training and, and along with the great work at with people at Lenovo. But to be a, sort of a member of his audience kind of showed me the power that it can have when he and his team members go out to schools and, and help them understand this. So, Bob, 
happy to send them out there. Anyways, the cost is going to be very affordable. And all it will include is for you to tell me that I'm right just one more time. Okay, good night, everybody. Never again. <laughs> Till next time. Learning Through Technology, a K-12 EdTech podcast is brought to you by STS Education, a Pacific One Source company. To learn more about how educators can leverage technology to drive successful educational outcomes, check us out at www.stsed.com. Connect with us by searching for Learning Through Technology in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or anywhere else podcasts are found. And click subscribe so you don't miss an episode. On behalf of the team at STS Education, thanks for joining us.